Hi, I'm Robert James, and welcome to my desk here at the International School of Gemology. I was reading this morning the latest edition of the Journal in Gemology from, uh, from London, and I once again saw an article on this Tibetan Andesine mine, and it was from the same people that was actually published some time ago with Gems in Gemology. And I had to start thinking, why are we still publishing this in influential publications when in fact there's so much documentation and so much information out there that says in fact this this mine doesn't exist. We have uh, information from Dr. George Rossman at Caltech that shows scientifically that all this stuff's been treated and that this mine doesn't exist and yet why are we getting this publication with this article in it at this late date and time with all this? I've had a lot of people call me and ask me about that and, and ask, you know, what, what about this? And I'm, I've told them that we do have a report out there. We have a report on our on our uh, gemstone treatment report website about this. But they say, well, it's so big we can't open it. The PDF file is so big that we really can't open that. So what we thought we would do, I, I just, I don't know. This morning I was reading this over and I thought, well, let's make this easy. Let's do a little YouTube video of this and see if we can get some information that people can actually watch on a grassroots level and just have some, I won't call it fun because it kind of stopped being fun about a year ago. But anyway, maybe we can get some answers for you that are grassroots level that we can all understand. Let's see if we can get to the bottom of this and the same thing. Hang on just a minute. I've got some slides in there in the computer where you are right now. I want you to take a look at so you can decide for yourself. The first problem is the contradictions in the Japanese report. You can see this is the first report that came out from Japan about what the mine looked like as well as the, the rough and then all of a sudden there's a report came out and it looked like this. There's a total contradiction in the formation, the rock, everything about it from these two reports coming out from the same Japanese organization and there's no explanation of why. And we sure don't know why they had to make mud pies to make it look like they had these stones in situ and uh, that they were gathering from the ground and, and there's a big thumbprint. But there's a lot more research involved that we want to talk about just as we can, particularly from Dr. Melisenda in Germany, showing that the anisine under immersion cell, the green interior with the red exterior, shows that it's treated. And with the organ material, the green, of course, is outside. That's the oxidation. But once again, in the Japanese report, their material that they're showing is all green internally, which Dr. Melisenda says it's all treated. And these are all specimens directly from these guys saying that they're mining this stuff out of Tibet, and yet every bit of it matches Melisenda's report for treated. Dr. Rossman did some very important work with Caltech about this when he talked about potassium argon dating and the, and the potassium argon testing. And I've got a demonstration I want you to see. Basically what Dr. Rossman had said in, in his report is that the fact that there's potassium in these feldspars means that over a period of time that potassium will break down to argon. That's what they call potassium argon dating. And by how much argon is inside the crystal, you can actually date the crystal. Because the important part about this is that as long as the crystal is left alone, in other words, if it's not heated or treated or anything, this argon will be in the crystal. But what happens is if you treat the crystal, if you start heating it, it starts losing the argon. And I'm, we're going to kind of demonstrate one of our cheesy ISG demonstrations here. Millions of years passing, feldspar crystal, argon building up. Crystal full of argon. What happens is somebody comes along and heats this up to treat it, to diffuse it, and all of it comes out. And then all of a sudden you have a crystal that rather than being full of argon, it has no argon, but all of a sudden the feldspar is red. It's been diffused, and the heat has taken all the argon out of the crystal itself and left you just with the feldspar with no argon but the red colors, and that's what we have with the Tibetan material. That is what we have. This is what essentially, and I'm sure this is oversimplification, Dr. Rossman will probably go, what is he thinking? But this essentially is what the potassium argon dating is all about. The fact that the crystals have no argon in them. They're red, they've been treated. This alone scientifically disproves anything that's been shown to be coming out of Tibet. So I wanted to show you this just for the grassroots idea of understanding the potassium argon dating and why that is so important, why Dr. Rossman's work with this was so important regarding the status of the material being claimed to come naturally out of this Tibetan mine. It's all of the red stuff with no argon and just a bunch of colors, but we're going to look at something else with this in just a minute. 
At the ISG, we have literally hundreds and hundreds of specimens, and I think everyone is used to seeing this particular photograph. This is the photograph of the specimen we found that actually proved the diffusion. You can see that this is the red dagger, we call it, showing the diffusion going into the stone. And you can see at the little arrows at the top, you've got the red spires extending into the stone. Those red, red spires are actually the red color diffusing into the crystal. And in actual uh, specimens that we got from the Tibetan guys, we see the same feature. It's the same red diffusion happening within the, the, the feldspar crystal uh, that they're claiming to come from Tibet and be natural. And yet it's got the same features that we know are diffusion features from other Andesine. There's been a lot of discussion about the true origin of this material that's being sold as Tibetan andesine. And there's been a lot of discussions because we at the ISG, when we tested this material out, it tested out very much parallel to the Mexican material that we have that is known to come from Casa Grande, Mexico. And there's been certain people get certain scientists say, well, by elemental analysis, this could not come from Mexico. The problem is, if you look at the andesine that's been diffused by elemental analysis, it has to come from Mars because it can't come from anywhere on Earth because it's got things in it that nobody knows. Nobody knows the diffusion of this material. And if you actually look at this and, and look at the chem chemical and elemental analysis of this, it doesn't show up to be from anywhere. And let me show you a demonstration of that, just one of our little demonstrations. This is going to be from the yellow feldspar. This is going to serve our, our little glass from yellow feldspar. If we take some of this and pour some of this water into this glass, by elemental analysis, this water equals this. We know it does. We could actually test this by elemental analysis and prove that this water came from this glass. But what if we take our second glass of water and diffuse it with a lot of unknown elements, and we put all sorts of elements in here that nobody really knows about, and we turn this red just like people are turning the feldspar red with the diffusion treatment. Suddenly, we've got our original yellow and we have our red, but do they equal by elemental analysis? Not at all. If you did an elemental analysis, and, and let's just say that this was Mexican yellow and this was Tibetan andesine, they could say, well, this does not come from Mexico because the elemental analysis. The problem is the sheer force of what you've done to this makes the elemental analysis no longer valid for being able to determine origin. What you have to do is go into something deeper, something that won't change necessarily because of a diffusion process. That's where we go into the internal characteristics of the stone, and that's what I want to show you right now. We've actually been able to collect specimens from China and from Mexico, match them up, except the Chinese showed a failed effort to treat. You can see at the lower right hand the failed effort to treat this Mexican piece, and we got this out of China. By comparing the internal characteristics, which we know are not going to change with the diffusion because the internal characteristics have to do with the structure, and matching those up, we find that the Mexican material and the Chinese material match up exactly. We can go with internal inclusion after inclusion, design after design. We, we can go across the board with the Chinese diffusion material from Tibet and the actual Mexican material and find the same. Look at this right here and compare it to this. This is directly out of the Japanese re report. The yellow there is known Mexican material. The red is from China, and it's exactly the same type of inclusion. We see this time after time, and with, I mean, we have just hundreds of specimens that we've been able to compare these to, and time after time, they all compare up with the same internal characteristics. This gives us very strong indicators that we've got the same material, even as recently as this last Tucson show did we find the ability to match up these inclusions, and certainly from other countries do not match, such as this from Madagascar. But if we take the reports from the various magazines that nobody can find the Tibet mine, the Chinese government cannot confirm or give us any information about the Chinese mine, there is just an overwhelming amount of evidence that says that this Tibetan mine just simply does not exist and we do not know why the reports continue but apparently they do. I hope this helped answer some of those questions about that Tibet mine for you. I've got to get back to work. Have a good day. Take care.